otherwise we will have uh, three more uh, very intellectually rich panels and uh, the first one comes about uh, artistic interpretation and subjectivity and I will leave you in a safe hands of uh, Professor Maria Dramaita, professor from Vilnius University and she's a specialist of 20th century um, history of architecture in Lithuania and the region. So Maria, the floor is yours. Hello and welcome to this session of modern heritage and subjectivity. Uh, many people ask to me what, why subjectivity and what do you mean by subjectivity? So I think uh, we will have this hour dedicated to discussion. How can we interpret it? But the basic um, driver which, which uh, encouraged to, to talk about it was that uh, in academia or in academic research of modern architecture and modern heritage, we usually have a goal of objective truth or some to form an objective or balanced uh, list of heritage or objective um, uh, interpretation of modern architecture and writing that just correct history of modernist architecture. So is it so that maybe it's a hypothesis, but we can discuss about that maybe the artistic field has left more liberal, more free for interpretation of modernist heritage or, or modern architecture in subjective way, which does not bound you with an academic goal of objective truth. So I was very much inspired by the title of um, Nicolas Grappier's book, Objective, uh, this subjective atlas of modern forms. And uh, that's uh, why I will pose this question to you, Nicolas, later after your presentation. Why did you title your book subjective atlas and not objective one, <laughs> for example, but. Today we will talk uh, on, this, on this topic with three very interesting and intriguing speakers. Uh, Nicolas Grospier is the Swiss photographer based in Poland. Uh, Lolita Jablonski is an art historian and curator and uh, speaker on, um, and director of the National Gallery of Art in Vilnius. And uh, Grzegorz Piątek is architect, uh, writer, critic, writing a lot about architecture and architect uh, in Warsaw, Poland. So I would like to invite Nicola first to give us an introduction about your subjective atlas of modern forms and other works. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> hello, um, I'm very uh, pleased uh, to, to be here to present uh, my work and thank you, Maria, for, for, for the, the kind invitation. Um, the subjective atlas of modern architecture is uh, the generic kind of title that I've given to a set of works that I've been carrying on for the last uh, 20 years and which took uh, different shapes and I'm going to go through, go through them uh, in a few in a few moments, but just to give you a general uh, uh, introduction about the, the the work and its uh, genesis, I've been photographing modernist architecture for the last uh, 20 years, and it, uh, it it was some kind of obsession for me. Um, everywhere I would go, I would uh, take some time to to photograph buildings, sometimes on purpose, sometimes uh, finding them by accident. And uh, about uh, eight years ago, I, I um, realized that I had a, a huge archive uh, uh, covering perhaps uh, several hundred photographs. And therefore, I, I, I thought that I should try to, uh, 
publish them and uh, uh, or show them and make them public. And but how to organize a set of uh, several hundred photographs of different buildings from different periods, mostly post-war modernism, but still uh, different formats in terms of, of you know a square, rectangular, horizontal, vertical, uh, different architects, different functions, and the uh, the, the most logical uh, kind of uh, uh, um, key to this uh, this set of, of photographs was the forms of the building. And I decided I would organize the whole set only and exclusively according uh, to the shape of the building. So uh, that was, uh, the result was this, uh, this book that was published in uh, 2016. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to browse through the very first photographs of the book and so that you can you can see the, the the way the way it is organized. So it starts with this very simple uh, um, uh, shape uh, of a, of a bus stop uh, in Crimea, and uh, I've chosen specifically this photo because uh, for once it's very simple, and for the second the, sh the shape of the building is is round. And I'll come I'll come back to this idea later on. So this is the first photo of the book, and then as you browse you see that the shapes evolve every now and then, uh, moving slowly uh, from one shape uh, to the next um, in a sort of uh, seamless, or at least an attempt at being a seamless uh, flow of, of images. So it's a very uh, well, uh, subjective in the sense that I, I focus exclusively on, on the shape because it, I, it seemed to me that it was the really only logical and also visually satisfying uh, way of organizing uh, these pictures. Uh, so I'm going to, I browse, I, I don't want to focus on, on any uh, photograph for the moment um, because I want to show uh, the logic behind it, but I want to focus at some point to stop because we are here in in in, in, in Kaunas in Lithuania, and uh, I have a very specific uh, uh, relation to uh, Lithuania because I live in Poland, but also because uh, actually my my uh, modernist architecture uh, uh, adventure uh, started here. And so, as you see, when this was the last photo of the first the sequence, now we jump to something completely different, uh, which we, which is actually a, a, a bus stop in Lithuania that I that I photographed in two thousand and. Too, I believe, and um, so these photos are also integrated into uh, the, the the series. But I, I, I thought that I should just focus slightly on on, on this very short sequence of, of photos from Lithuania because we're here, and because uh, um, well, I, as I as I told, I have this this relation to uh, to Lithuanian uh, modernist architecture. So. Actually, that was in 2002, and I photographed more of these of these bus stops uh, because I thought that they were simply wonderful, uh, uh, simple, uh, and, and and colorful and, and joyous. Also, a bit uh, like uh, absurd because very often um, these bus stops were uh, in the middle of nowhere. It seemed to me at least. In fact, there was a logic behind it because the roads in Lithuania bypassed the, 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 the villages and therefore the, the bus stops are very often outside of the villages and therefore it looks like the bus stop is in the middle of nowhere. In fact, it's quite close to the village. Uh, but you would have some very, uh, well, constructivist, I would say, or Mandrianesque-like uh, uh, bus stops, or even Chinese or something resembling to a, a Chinese kind of design. So that was a, the, this first small, small sequence which is integrated in the, in the whole. But then we can jump to other Lithuanian buildings because of course the, the whole sequence is mostly visual, but I try also to focus on the some, well every building is described in the book and you, you, the, the reader is invited to discover the specificities. Uh, in this specific case, this is the, the uh, House of Ritual, Ritual Services in, uh, in, in Vilnius. And so it's uh, basically uh, something that can replace a church when there is a funeral. Uh, uh, in Soviet times, as there was, uh, the religion was, was limited to the minimum, uh, that was the, 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 the place where, where people would organize the, 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 the funerals. On the other end of the spectrum, 
uh, you have the Palace of Weddings, also in Vilnius, and it, which is also uh, a Soviet specificity, since, as I was saying, you know, religion was, was limited. Um, then uh, there is, uh, this building, for instance, was in, in Druskininka, it was destroyed. Many of the buildings that I photographed were destroyed. Uh, this one as well. Uh, this one was also a, a very incredible um, uh, sanatorium in, in Druskininkai. Um, and I, I would like to show you this one also. This is part of this, this uh, sanatorium in, in Druskininkai. And this, so and eventually the building, the, 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 the book was published a few times and, and this year comes the third edition, which is an expanded version of the subjective atlas. But then I made the continuation of this work is, the first part was about uh, uh, exteriors, and then I made modern spaces, which is about the interiors. And it has the same, ah, I forgot to mention that uh, the book is also organized as a loop. The, the last photograph is the photograph of the, of the bus stop, the round one. So the, the, the bus stop symbolizes a bit the, the, the sort of uh, looping of the cycle. And the same thing happens in modern spaces. So you have a, a round element central in the photograph, and exactly f uh, in the same fashion, you browse through spaces which uh, are reminiscent formerly uh, one uh, to the next. Uh, this is in the Crimea, for instance. Let me go. This is, in, this is in Sri Lanka. I was struck by the fact that you could have a garage in your living room. Um, this is in, in, in Warsaw. Let me, let me go through uh, a bit more uh, quickly. Um, but so this, this uh, the relation between the images is more loose in this particular um, uh, atlas, this one, uh, because, well, formally a building from the outside can relate more easily to another. Here the relations are to the, the material or to the, 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 the different elements or to the function. Well, obviously here in this specific sequence where I'm, I'm, I'm showing staircases, now I'm turning to uh, round uh, 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 corridors, uh, um, moving to uh, uh, yet more corridors, until I go to uh, this image. And this, in fact, the image is uh, taken from the inside of this balneo um, of this sanatorium in Druskininkai, which I mentioned a few moments earlier, which was as fascinating and striking from the outside as it was from the, from, from the inside as it was from the outside. Uh, you would. I, I liked it so much that I actually used it as a, the, the, the cover photo for the, for the book. Um, this, I think, was the, the director's room, but I'm not sure. And, and finally, you would have the, the, mm, 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 the interior swimming pool, which is absolutely mind-blowing. This is the interior of the Palace of Weddings, which looks like, a, like an administrative hall. But in fact, it has very uh, quite astonishing details. Um, for me, that these hangi hanging uh, sculptures are very symbolic of the way uh, uh, a marital union may end. Um, this is yet another space from Lithuania. I've, I've jumped to uh, uh, the, 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 the sequence uh, which focuses on, on, on Lithuanian uh, 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 late modernism, post-war modernism. And I want to sh end this spot part of the sequence with this image, which is actually was taken a few hundred meters from where we are right now. And this is the, an image from the uh, resurrection of, of Christ Church, which I believe uh, a, a group is set to uh, visit tomorrow. And I photographed the church in 2004 before it was re uh, or consecrated as a church. Because th this church was, if I'm not mistaken, built in the interwar, interwar period, but not finished or not consecrated. And after the Second World War, it was transformed into a television factory. And that was the moment when uh, the, the, the church was being, well, redone as a church uh, from a, a place where you would have the voice of the party through television to the voice of God through uh, 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 a church. And you see the, the, the columns are, uh, show the partition of the, of, the, of the church into floors, which I find quite striking. And um, so this is, this, uh, this is the way I, I developed uh, uh, the subjective atlas into two books, but it so happens that I'm, I, I, I received a few days ago uh, an, uh, a new book of mine which is about to be released and which is also a very specific and subjective view on, uh, on a subject and I call it a house for, 
for culture. And I, I um, um, realized that there were two organizations, uh, the Kohos and the Kibbutz, which have the same roots, uh, that is the, the idea of the collective farm, that were implemented in completely opposite uh, political systems in Israel and in the Soviet Union. So and I embarked onto a tour of uh, all the Baltic states because I focused on the Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, and in Israel. I photographed over uh, 80 uh, kibbutzim and 80 kohoses, focusing only on the communal uh, buildings that are the buildings which were dedicated to the community in order to strengthen their bonds. And astonishingly, uh, well, architecturally, the program of these buildings was very similar between Israel and the, 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 the Soviet Baltic states, but also formally. And the book here is a, the, a set of photographs which show the different parts of, of, uh, of the, the book, the way the book is organized. I systematically made the book so that you can compare the uh, building structures on the one hand, that is on the left-hand side, that would be Israel. On the right-hand side would be the Baltic states. Um, and, and so here again, it's a sort of a very, well, perhaps a, a ludic or, or um, a, a subjective uh, viewpoint on, uh, on, on, on the topic. Uh, but I believe that uh, it also tackles uh, on, a, on a deeper level uh, Oh, so the, 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 the book also is, is like there's a rhythm of photographs and then sometimes of, of exteriors and then there are photographs of interiors. But, so, but I wanted to say that the, the, what the book tackles, you know, apart from the, the question of visual similarity, is the question of public space, uh, the, the house of culture or the canteen, because uh, in Israel there were the uh, two uh, communal buildings, uh, the, the, so the, the, the house of culture and, uh, and the, the communal restaurant. Uh, they, are, they are given to the community uh, for, um, well, uh, their enjoyment, uh, well, spiritual or, or cultural, uh, but also, well, uh, physical. And um, I think that this is a, a, a I believe that there was, that was a very important paradigm uh, in the modernist era that sometimes uh, mm, has been lost somehow uh, in the last in the last 20 years. This idea of space, uh, which is uh, free of, of economic uh, constraint and which is uh, which is given to uh, uh, to the to the community to the people um, for, for for their enjoyment. Um, so I'm, I'm continuing to, to show the different, the diff different photos. Um, and so I'm really happy to be able to show these, uh, this, this new uh, uh, body of work uh, right now, well, simply because I'm also in Lithuania, as I was mentioning. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. When, when I look at those pictures, of course, I understand that it's a subjective selection of, of uh, objects. But uh, on the other hand, the pure form without any context, let's say, also can be interpreted as global, objective atlas of modern forms because they are stripped of uh, contested histories, stripped of geographies, stripped of chronologies. You just follow and look that globally people followed similar forms, several selection of similar forms. So I think it also invites for, for, for a thought and um, uh, for discussion. And then I would like to invite uh, for a talk uh, Lolita Mm -hmm. Lolita Jablonskine, because since the opening of the National Gallery of Art in Vilnius in 2009, many exhibitions were actually dedicated not only to pure art, but also to interpreting architecture and design. And Lolita curated, observed, commented it, and uh, it is very interesting to, to share your, your thoughts on how can you summarize the previous decades. Thank you, Maria. 
uh, I wonder if you already saw the title of my presentation that you somehow put a, uh, you know, uh, an accent of on context because indeed uh, when thinking after being invited here to talk, um, what could I uh, share with you? I came up with sort of a quasi title uh, for my uh, presentation, uh, which uh, tells it becomes meaningful in the context. And then I raise a you know, speculative question, uh, maybe it becomes modernism in the context. Um, uh, our um, uh, last uh, keynote, um, uh, he mentioned uh, in between his, uh, you know, uh, the ideas that um, uh, it is important, or we often think about what to keep and what to maintain when we speak about the modernist heritage. Uh, but in my uh, talk, I will focus on Lithuania, and I think that in our case, especially when we speak about the second half of the 20th century, uh, it's not yet this question. It's the question uh, what to include into the notion of modernism and what not. And only then it comes to uh, what to keep and to maintain. Maybe it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but somehow. So, uh, my next slide uh, is uh, taken from the book which Maria co-edited and it shows one of the famous Lithuanian architects, modernists of the second half of the 20th century, Vytautas Šankanauskas, uh, sort of both uh, sure in something what he says and also quite unsure in what he says. So, I think it symbolizes perfectly uh, the situation um, uh, regarding the discourse of modernism in relation to architecture and also to visual arts uh, at the, uh, in the beginning of the 1990s. Um, those who had the possibility to read the book or at least you know, flip through the pages know that it was um, is based on interviews with famous Lithuanian Soviet period architects whom we now call modernists. Um, uh, and interviews were conducted in the very early 90s by uh, the then young American scholar, uh, uh, Mr. Machuka. And the book represents a complete clash and I would say a rather, uh, you know, misunderstanding uh, between Lithuanian architects and the American scholar about what they are talking about, what the m notion of modernism or the discourse of modernism is, what the practice is, and the production of modernism, if you wish. So in that sense, I think, uh, you know, uh, we think, uh, I start with, uh, you know, how the contexts clash together, how uh, they shape the discourse of modernism and what we think about it. Uh, later, we certainly had books published, including the famous uh, architecture in the Soviet Lithuania, where Maria and Vaidas have contributed to, uh, they, which have already set the context for, uh, you know, understanding what modernism is in the Lithuanian architecture of the Soviet period. Uh, I wanted also to share uh, some slides, you know, and my thoughts about how curated exhibitions contributed to constructing certain contexts for, um, you know, deepening the paradigm of uh, modernism in architecture, design and visual arts after the Second World War in Lithuania. So you see here three exhibitions that we organized uh, at the National Gallery of Art. Cold War Modern, designed 1945-1975, uh, that was taken over from uh, Victoria and Albert Museum. Then uh, Modernization, Baltic Art, Architecture and Design, 60-70s, which I co-curated with colleagues from Estonia and Latvia. And Our Metamorphic Futures, uh, which is on, on your right, um, the, which was curated by Estonian colleagues. So I think these exhibitions uh, have established and legitimized at least three discourses which have, or contexts in which, you know, um, the, our imagination of what modernism in architecture, design and fine arts might be in the Lithuanian context. So uh, Cold War Modern was certainly about 
uh, you know, the competition between East and West uh, during the Cold War and the imagination of that, you know, uh, that was inspired by this competition. So it's the international context of modernism. Then the modernization exhibition is about uh, a, mm, a, the Baltic context, something between the Soviet system and the regionality, which uh, again became the context of interpreting. And then uh, the third exhibition was about, um, you know, the uh, inside of the Soviet system and the possibility of experiment with modernism uh, or which leads to the mod uh, modernism that, uh, you know, um, it also, you know, initiates the discussion. The third example, I just took one of the recent exhibition organized by the Vilnius Museum, which is called maybe to Virshulishkes. Um, and as you see from the slides, it was, um, you know, the uh, project which checked the idea of modernism, especially modern urban projects of the Soviet period uh, within the community. I don't have to talk much about that because Konas has now more experience probably, but I think the context of the community is also another context uh, which uh, is important when uh, shaping the idea of what modernism is. Well, I did include also um, uh, if, uh, this slide which shows a couple of quite famous art, contemporary artworks, uh, you know, both of them are videos uh, produced in, in the 21st century, which re uh, retroactivate the notion of uh, modernism. And uh, Maria certainly mentioned that, and I think this was an important moment in uh, generally shaping the discourse uh, for Lithuania when we speak about Soviet uh, period uh, modernism and its heritage, um, they, you know, where contemporary artists have been approaching, uh, you know, this idea. So Demantas Narkevich's famous film about, uh, the, you know, uh, industrial heritage or the power plant in Elektriene, analyzing sort of the notion of, you know, Soviet utopia and its disappearance. And in the case of Koro Collective, the three uh, women artists who produced this um, film based on dance was a much more hybrid approach to, uh, to the modernism. So it included modernist building in Vilnius, the sports hall, uh, the, uh, you know, costumes designed by Tristan Tsara and elements of dance with the Vogue dance of the 80s, uh, or Vogue dance of the 80s, which, you know, uh, included, you know, other uh, modernist, uh, you know, um, elements uh, which come already from the international context. So one would be more a local paradigm, another a more hybrid paradigm, you know, uh, uh, of approaching uh, modernism. Uh, I see that my time is running, you know, out, so I'll be very uh, quick with my few other slides. I just wanted to show how in approaching visual arts of the same period, let's say of the Soviet uh, period, uh, modernism, um, uh, notions of modernism as aesthetics and as artistic strategy can be constructed. This is already related to the, what we call, let's say, interpretive uh, art history, where subjectivity also comes in, because interpretations are based on uh, multiple modernities, uh, the variety of modernisms uh, that we are speaking now when speaking about modernism in general. So just to, uh, you know, tell you a couple of those strategies. One of them would be that you start recognizing what is modernism uh, through dichotomy, through uh, uh, tearing apart. Uh, in this case, on the left side, on the left side, you see the official uh, Soviet uh, Lithuanian art, and on the right side, you see, say, unofficial, uh, you know, Soviet Lithuanian art, and through this division, you identify what is modern. So that's a strategy which is not the uh, only strategy. Uh, it could be or it was made in Lithuanian uh, curatorship and art historiography through uh, separating also uh, the same using dichotomy, official art spaces and unofficial art spaces. So, uh, uh, you know, artworks which were presented in unofficial art spaces, they would be associated with modernism. So modernism came as something which opposes to official. 
However, uh, when um, re remaking the uh, permanent hang of the collection of uh, modern and contemporary art at the National Gallery, we chose a different strategy. I was one of the curators of that, not of separating, but rather of joining uh, contexts uh, which were previously separated, um, uh, you know, in, in the strategies which I just mentioned before. Uh, probably don't have much time to talk about it, so I just leave it for you to observe, you know, with the titles where we try to combine things which were uh, earlier attributed to official art than to non-official art, various contexts. And the last slide which I wanted to show and also maybe to suggest the topic for discussion is about demodernizing. Uh, demodernizing, which actually happens uh, when uh, artworks of uh, the, you know, the modern period are included, especially by curators, but also by contemporary artists, in uh, you know their exhibitions or into their artworks, where uh, the time of the production of an artwork and the time of its viewing suddenly come together. So the work starts losing the meaning that it had in, uh, you know, while being interpreted as a modernist artwork. And it's involved or upholstered, let's say, uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, discourses of today. And in these two cases, uh, you know, um, these are uh, a curated project and a contemporary art project. These, uh, the modernist, you know, heritage, heritage has been, um, sort of put into one uh, with ideas uh, uh, suggested by new materialism and critique of Anthropocene, which I believe is going to be, you know, the next topic of, uh, you know, or the topic of the next, uh, next uh, panel. Sorry for going over the limit, but that was something maybe for us to discuss further. Thank you, thank you, Lolita, for inspiration to think. But when I again, when I looked at your presentation, I noticed uh, that uh, while the heritage specialists and historians had argued about uh, what is appropriate uh, uh, to include from the Soviet era into the canon or into the heritage list of, of Lithuanian modernism. Uh, artists somehow were enabled to interpret it more freely and with a much more provocative way. And in a way, they actually inspired and were forward, uh, went forward to introduce these topics into the broader society. So somehow it feels that heritage specialists uh, uh, or official historians, they were bound by some objectivity that was expected from them, whereas artists, in their more subjective way, could act more freely in, uh, in interpreting this. But, uh, okay, we will be back. Now, I would like to invite Grzegorz Piątek, and why I will explain why I see um, uh, Grzegorz as a very good speaker in this session, but maybe he has different <laughs> idea. Uh, I will refer to three recent books that uh, Grzegorz wrote. The first was on the reconstruction of, war, of Warsaw in the post-war period. The second was about architect Bogdan Pniewski, the one of the most famous architects of the 20th century Poland. And the third, which is, which is coming this, this month, uh, it's about Gdynia. But uh, if you look at the topics, all topics are already known in the discourse and uh, they already have the objective history in a way. So you are trying to deconstruct the myth, retell your own story, or you have noticed something that was missing. So please, Gregor, Thank comment. You. Um, I decided to be very modest and not talk about my work, <laughs> but I will keep on referring to the, to the themes that are you know, in my books. Uh, I decided to talk about the popular subjective view of modern architecture in, in Poland and challenge it slightly and try to, and to talk about a way 
potential way out uh, to, about the potential objective view. So uh, in Poland, um, you can definitely see a continuity in 20th century architecture. And Bogdan Pniewski, one, my, the protagonist of my book, is a, is a great example that you can talk about an evolution rather than revolution, revolutions. But uh, the political history interferes and uh, modern architecture in Poland is easily bro broken down into pre-war modernism and post-war modernism. I believe it's, you can relate to that in Lithuania, that there's a, there's a, there's a big um, um, divide between these two eras in the popular perception. And uh, these two periods are viewed totally in a totally different way, totally opposite ways. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see Gdynia, the pre-war Gdynia, the city uh, founded in the interwar period, which is a bit like Konas. It's, uh, it's very much related uh, to Polish independence and to Polish nation building. And um, the pre-war modernism is seen universally as a good thing, and it was never challenged, actually. It was, has always been seen as a, as a source of pride. It's associated with good quality even though some of the buildings were built very cheaply and uh, are very difficult to maintain nowadays. It's, of, it's uh, popularly associated with technological advancement, even though many modern uh, pre-war modern buildings were built in traditional techniques, uh, building techniques. Um, and it's also universally uh, associated with social progress, even though uh, Poland was a quite a conservative country and uh, towards uh, the Second World War, it drifted towards a very militaristic and nationalistic uh, dictatorship. But uh, so there is this nebulous idea of progress associated with pre-war modernism. It's, um, it's uh, universally, uh, universally um, seen as a source of a pride and it's also very um, it's also emulated by modern archi by contemporary architects because it's also associated with good quality of housing of, of, of luxury housing so on the right hand side you can see one contemporary uh, housing project in Gdynia uh, actually one of the developers in this city is called Moderna which is very telling because it's you know this modernism modernity Moderna is a more popular term in Polish is associated with good quality and with, uh, it's like a, f you know, like this family photo that you cherish and you, um, of, of uh, this ideal picture of, 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 uh, of uh, Poland before the Second World War. Uh, and when it comes to post-war modernism, um, it's associated with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, the, with negative uh, things like, cheap uh, technologies with uh, anonymous housing, with uh, um, monotony, with uh, repetitive uh, spatial solutions, with standardizations. And, uh, you know, it, a lot of it is, is rooted in the, in the character of this architecture. It was often, um, it was often based on, on um, standard designs and on repeating the same forms. Uh, but there was also a great deal of experimentation in it uh, that uh, is not um, mm, uh, that 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 is sometimes causing trouble right now because of the technologies were experimental, they don't age so well, and you know this criticism started already before the fall of communism. That's an interesting thing that it's it was a generational thing. It was it was about the general disenchantment with the modernist project and with the modernist uh, model of the city, with the modernist, modernist urban planning. Um, and it uh, gained very good, uh, let's say, ground, very fertile ground after 89, when all of this post-war heritage could be easily put in a box with the label communism and labeled as something to be um, something that we should get rid of at, at every possible occasion. What happened uh, actually after 89, that even though it was the housing projects that were the, the, you know, the most criticized, they are still there because they are useful and also the ownership structure is very complicated, so it's not so easy to get rid of uh, the housing projects and uh, I'm very, very happy. But we started losing some of the most iconic buildings that were just more easy to tear down especially cinemas, department stores, pavilions like the Super Sam, this is the first Polish supermarket from 1962, uh, that is, was uh, very easily replaced with um, a shopping center 
um, around 10 years ago. And actually, SuperSAM was the first subject of the first compa public campaign to save a modernist building in, 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 in Poland. Uh, but it was unsuccessful. Um, and it's, it's a really paradoxical situation that now the political stigma is gone after 30 years and uh, this modernist aesthetics that Super Sam was a great uh, uh, example of is now fashionable and now it's okay to like this type of aesthetics. Uh, and the neon museum that collects neon signs uh, taken down from buildings, some of them being demolished in, 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 in Warsaw is a big tourist attraction. But actually, the space that these neons were uh, were um, a part of is not uh, there anymore in many cases because we got rid of so many uh, so many valuable buildings already by the time the political stigma was um, uh, was gone. And the, another irony is that actually the the most politically problematic building in in post-war Poland, the Palace of Culture and Science, which is the uh, a direct Soviet import, not even a Polish adaptation of some Soviet model, is still there because it's um, it's uh, because of it was it's too it was always too difficult to get rid of, and also and now it's also already under heritage protection, and it's universally valued as an icon of the city. But you know it worked in very mysterious, um, chaotic ways. And what happens now is that, and that is, I, I think that it, it's interesting to point it out that the same set of um, set of um, myths surrounds uh, postmodern architecture, the architecture of the capitalist transformation in Poland. We actually lost uh, earlier this year this iconic building, the Solpol department store in Wrocław, and it's amazing to see that the uh, negative uh, propaganda around it was. Uh, echoed exactly the negative propaganda surrounding the communist uh, modernist building before. It was cheaply built, it's unfashionable, it's ugly, it belongs to a bygone era of uh, early capitalism that we are happy to uh, forget about. And it was, uh, it was demolished earlier this year. Uh, there was also a huge campaign to save it, but unsuccessful. And um, to finish, I would like to talk about one very interesting case of uh, well, trying to move beyond subjectivity in uh, in Poland in the um, assessment and the you know the evaluation of, of uh, modernist buildings, in 2003 the po the Warsaw chapter of SARP, the Architects Association, formulated a, a set of criteria for post-war buildings uh, with heritage protection in mind and selected over one 133 buildings and spaces in Warsaw according to these criteria from between 45 and 89 uh, that, you know, sought to have an objective so set of criteria. This list is already uh, much shorter because we lost many buildings uh, in the meantime. And uh, this, this is not a success story, unfortunately. This, uh, this criteria uh, were not applied in, in, um, by the government or by the local government. But still, I think it could be very inspiring, uh, inspiring to look at them right now because they could help us go beyond this subjective uh, view of architecture and maybe help us with uh, with protecting the most valuable buildings before we lose them like we lost Solpol or SuperSAM. And also to move beyond the notions of taste and um, you know personal preference. So the first point is innovation. Second is relation to the context, both the original context and the context, uh, the, the contemporary context. Then there's the relation to existing tradition, but also contradicting this tradition is seen as a value. Uh, then there's the symbolic or iconic value, so, you know, the buildings that are recognizable even by people from beyond, uh, from, from, uh, from outside of the city. Then you have the recognition by contemporaries, awards, prizes, rankings, polls. Then you have the, the test of time, so the level of preservation the artistic value and the singularity, and it both pertains to unique solutions and also to last remaining, um, last surviving examples of a type. I think could, we could expand this list right now. We could add social value, we could, uh, we could add um, some environmental value, we could add also uh, some cultural value, like places that were 
uh, used for film locations or uh, were uh, you know mentioned in uh, famous books etc so this cultural let's say value of the building is also important but i uh, and i um, this is the last slide i'm about to finish uh, so this is uh, i think it's important to look at this list and to go back to it and i'm and i remind uh, and i like to talk about it on every occasion because this story is not is relatively unknown it's relatively forgotten even in, even in poland it's not even properly archived on any website you have to really dig to to find it but it's a good starting point i think to move beyond subjectivity and to um, protect certain buildings and spaces before we lose them in this um, very subjective discussion thank you Thank you. Thank you, Grzegorz. Uh, this list uh, reminds me of a similar project carried out uh, not very far, um, many years ago in, here in Lithuania also, with an attempt to find the objective criteria to evaluate modernist heritage. And uh, when I listen to you look at your list and look at, um, at the list which we're working uh, on that, isn't it an illusion <laughs> illusion that the objective criteria can be reached and the subjectivity will be eliminated i mean it, it's impossible to eliminate subjectivity and it's also you know it's not like eurovision that the more your points you get uh, the the better you are and you win but i think it's 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 useful to have these tools that help you structure the your 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 assessment of of architecture and uh, then I would like to ask um, Lolita to follow up uh, about this construction of context and contextualizing um, uh, modernist heritage. Is it bad or good? Uh, are we proud of it or not? And uh, do you think uh, in some time in the longer run, this context becomes the imagined objectivity or the imagined objective criteria? Well, uh, yeah, I think so. You know, uh, in the succession of uh, somehow related to chronology, which I had uh, uh, in my slides, I exactly wanted to, uh, you know, highlight that uh, these contexts slightly change. And for a certain period of time, they kind of, uh, you know, establish themselves as, su as some sort of objectivity. But then, uh, you know, with... Uh, uh, I don't know, new research, new material coming in, with new uh, discourses appearing, uh, you know, context starts slightly changing or even completely changing, you know, and then the uh, idea of ob objectivity becomes really, you know, sort of rather an illusion, and especially with uh, contemporary times and contemporaneity, which, you know, uh, as I said, you know, layers these times of today, yesterday, the day before yesterday into something one. So then the objectivity of the meaning, uh, you know, of an artwork, let's say, or design object produced, uh, you know, uh, in the 60s or 70s, um, they completely or almost loses any sense uh, because the context is of today, uh, which completely deletes uh, uh, you know, what was important in the previous semi-objective context. There is an element of that. Though, you know, I do agree with Grzegorz that, you know, certain principles, you know, uh, should be maintained at least for the period of time, you know, that, uh, you know, we speak the same language at least. Well, speaking about the uh, same or different languages is, is very important, of course. But then my question is to Nicolas. Uh, when you started photographing these, these forms, these objects, uh, how much the context was also important for you? Was it this pure form that was attractive and you wanted to find out more about the building or structure later? Or you had some preparation also about the context of these mm. structures? 
I mean, it was not something that I thought out uh, from the start, but uh, as I, I photographed these, these buildings, it came to me that, uh, you know, because I'm not trained neither as a photographer nor an architect or an artist, I'm trained as a social scientist, I came to realize that uh, the, mo the modernist uh, program had very, very ambitious social objectives, and, uh, and that spoke to me. And I thought that it would be that it was simply interesting uh, to to uh, to focus on this kind of architecture, especially the 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 the, the architecture which is uh, the public ones like the hospitals, museums, uh, train stations, etc. Thank you. I think we still have some ten minutes for for a discussion and questions. Do do you have questions to our speakers or? Yes, Ute, please. Mm -hmm. Please. Uh, um, yeah, thank you. It's it's maybe not so much a question. It's rather, a, um, I think, a statement. Um, I mean, for me, subjectivity is part of objectivity, and uh, and I think Grigorz was mentioning it at the end. I think this canon, this this idea of values, has very much changed, at least um, in in terms of identifying significance of of heritage, also of modern heritage, but also for older heritage, um, over the last 20 years. So these aspects of uh, um, cultural value, social value, and uh, also the um, which embraces actually the, the society and, and laymen and, and, and opinion of, of other individuals next to experts um, is, has pretty much come um, or become praxis. The, the, of course, the issue is how to, how to measure it, how to find it out. And, and you know, there is a lot of activities, at least in research, related to using artificial intelligence to follow up on social media, on posts, on what are people thinking, how they are, um, how they are, um, um, perceiving um, not just architecture but also other heritage. So in that sense, um, for me this question <laughs> is a bit artificial, um, um, objective versus um, uh, subjective, um, but of course it's true that um, the general practice um, when it comes to heritage listing um, in, um, in different countries uh, through, um, um, through official institutions is still pretty much based I would say on this more historical, um, artistic and historic value, which I think is an old model, um, but of course uh, it is still uh, pretty much applied, I would say, um, maybe by, um, by the heritage departments. But, but I think the general uh, discourse is much further. But um, um, I have also another maybe really question uh, because I learned that uh, Kaunas 2020 will measure the impact of this campaign uh, related to how did how is the public has the public been involved or how has the perception of the public been changed towards modern architecture for example so that would be interesting um, I'm not sure if it is the right question to you how this will be measured because I think that is something we really should take with us I, I, I think I will take more questions if, if there are <laughs> Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. What, what I found fascinating in um, in in this panel and uh, this discussion is the fact that subjectivity does not apply only to uh, the way arch modern architecture is uh, being received or is received by uh, by a certain audience, uh, but also and very much to uh, to the channels through which it is interpreted and uh, especially the artistic uh, way to do it, like the different uh, media uh, to do it. And, and, and here I think that uh, subjectivity means not only the one of the, the artist or the viewer, uh, but also the one of a particular uh, context and idiosyncrasy of that context. Uh, in Poland, um, um, photography and design are two, uh, including graphic design of course, uh, are two very powerful uh, uh, media to uh, interpret modern uh, modernist architecture and to uh, support the discussion around uh, the disappeared, moved, also building uh, that uh, Grzegorz has been uh, mentioning. 
and uh, Lithuania through visual arts in particular and contemporary art and performance has also powerful channels uh, to do that. And, uh, and I mean, what have you have been presenting here uh, are things that we have been presenting in Collective City Radius uh, to an international audience, one of a UNESCO listed building. And uh, it resonates very much with this international audience because it's quite specific, both to the Baltic and in particular to Lithuania and to Poland. And we will hardly find <laughs> in other uh, part of Europe um, as much uh, available uh, channels and media for interpreting modernist architecture are at least not as much invested by artists. So here I would like really to, to emphasize that. You're, you're not whoever <laughs> in terms of this, uh, uh, this capacity to convey uh, a discussion over this architecture through, through art, design, visual arts, and so on. Your particular cases. And uh, Owen had a question also. Uh -huh. Um, so it's it, it, it's a question for Maria and Lolita, but it's kind of really going coming building on something Shekrosh was saying, um, which is really about he sort of gave this obviously this very I think sort of scathing assessment of the sort of interwar Polish architecture and the kind of myths that are around it and the way that actually they don't the kind of public esteem for it doesn't actually accord with, you know, a sort of, let's say, objective historical analysis of 1930s Poland, which was a sort of, you know, fairly unpleasant right-wing authoritarian regime. And my question is, do you think, is there, or do you think there could be research on, for instance, Kaunas in the same period that would be similarly um, critical of that architecture's sort of myths and the kind of, the kind of way it exists in public esteem and also its relation to power? Thank you. So I think we will make a round of answers. Which questions do you do you take from, from all comments? What would you like to answer? But uh, I very much like uh, Owen's question about Konas. And I think this is what uh, Grzegorz did about Gdynia. You wanted to look deeper, to look behind this uh, festival uh, <laughs> promotion of Gdynia as the only positive and pride uh, of the nation. So I think with Konas it will come too, because first of all we started digging, nobody answered me the question from which money Konas was built. Uh, and uh, when we start digging, we are finding, uh, and I think there's a future research. And then of course we can um, look uh, on authoritarian representation of the state, all other questions, and the standard of living, and why there was no social housing promoted or built, or uh, many, many questions for, from the critical point of view. But I think usually these questions come after the, some kind of canon is constructed, or, or some, some, something is constructed. So I will pass uh, uh, the not the microphone, you have your own microphones, but just to reflect on uh, uh, which question would you like to answer to our uh, audience? I, I, I had a feeling that the question about assessment of uh, the impact of uh, Konas 22 on the perception of modern architecture in Konas was directed to me. Was it, is that true? Was it directed to me, your question about the uh, assessment of uh, the impact no, because I thought you were looking at me all the time. Because <laughs> <laughs> no, I can, I can, no, I, I don't, I, I cannot comment on that. I have no idea how to do it. But uh, I, I think there's, you know, um, th this comes, th these things with mythologizing and then uh, re re revisions of mythologies, they come in cycles. That uh, and it's, uh, it's interesting whether it's possible to break the cycle. And I, I think that the having sets of criteria like this could be, could, could. Facilitated, facilitate that, that you start, you know, to look objectively at a certain era as early as possible if you have a set of certain criteria. I know. 
but then I will comment because we also set the criteria and logical thing uh, for, for example to assessing Lithuanian post-war architecture was also we believe that this Lithuanian modernists that Lolita has shown the, the, their new and uh, modernist buildings locally produced in a way opposing a little bit to the Soviet standards is a very positive story and people should love this. But people choose the Stalinist period buildings because they are better decorated. It's completely the same story as, as, as with you. And uh, it means that it doesn't meet uh, objective criteria, which we made into the list. That's why I, I say that there are other emotional ties, associative values, some subjective values. Why, why the objective criteria not work or not always work? If I could, I mean, I, unfortunately, due to the lack of time, I couldn't develop more on uh, this, uh, you know, strategy of um, joining together, uh, you know, things which were earlier, let's say, for Lithuania, um, somehow artificially kept apart, official, non-official, uh, you know, objective, non-objective, subjective. So I think when one speaks about the critical revision of, you know, the project, it should still come together with the construct, constructed paradigm so that it both uh, reviews it but still shows the, um, you know, the important foundations in that. So that coming uh, together, you know, I think is something which probably is important and I would still add a little bit to what you asked earlier and uh, you, the colleague from Marseille about contemporary artists and them being more, uh, you know, free to, uh, you know, subjectively interpreting. I have to admit, as a curator, I'm not that optimistic in this line. I think that, and uh, not only myself, I've, quite well-known, you know, critic and curator Claire Bishop has given lectures on the topic uh, telling uh, or asking how did we become so nostalgic uh, towards modernism or of modernism, where she noticed that there's this sort of, um, you know, repeating line of uh, projects all over the world where contemporary artists are using uh, topics or subjects and even images, you know, of modernist architecture and, uh, you know, um, well, that becomes like a pool of things which are similar to each other. I think uh, there are certain works which initiate the discourse or which really critically address the status quo, which were really important both in Lithuania and in many other countries, and especially in countries off center, uh, you know, in uh, South America, in East and Central Europe, in Asia, uh, where things which were not discussed before were uh, opened and, um, you know, maybe somehow in an original way addressed by contemporary artists. Uh, but uh, it's not like each and every, you know, um, art project or artwork, uh, you know, liberates us more and more in our uh, attitudes. That's what I think. <clears throat> the final word of yours. Yes, uh, I, I was uh, also listening to Ruta what you're saying, and uh, and I, I couldn't agree more. It seems to me that uh, there's a fascinating actually dialectics between subjectivity and objectivity, in, in the sense that uh, things that are considered uh, not interesting uh, now will be considered interesting in 20 years time or in five years time, and it's this this movement back and forth between the individual voice of the artist, the researcher, the avant-garde thinker who puts forward the specific thing that he thinks is interesting at this or valuable or beautiful at any moment in time creates the motion. Because if actually we, and, and I'm coming back to this idea of, of set of criteria uh, that, that could be objective or could be approached as objective, if there were such a set of criteria that we would know everything we would know already what is what is valuable and and therefore there would be any progress in the way we think about uh, uh, architecture or uh, anything for that matter so um, I, I I like this kind of, of, of balance and uh, but f finally uh, I was also thinking that uh, from my perspective it's it's funny that uh, you know my main uh, 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 tool is an objective 
So thank you very much and thank you all. You will have the chance to talk to our speakers during the coffee break and see you at the uh, next session. Not yet. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria, and uh, your team for adding another layer to the discussion of uh, uh, how we invent or reinvent modernism. And uh, I uh, should uh, have a very short reaction to uh, a few of the uh, topics. So first of all, I should confess that uh, uh, I was the source for UTA and uh, about uh, measuring the impact. And uh, I know that it's going to be to be done, but uh, I do not know the methodology and uh, I'm waiting uh, as well as you about results.